Hello and welcome to special discussion with Prime Minister the Honourable Alan Chastney as we look back at the achievements and challenges of 2019. This is the final part in a three-hour discussion with the Prime Minister looking at various key areas as stated in his 2019 2020 budget presentation and so we are now down to the areas of citizen safety and later on we'll be discussing what's happening with infrastructure but for citizen safety for st lucians many consider it to be a, a very dismal year dark and gloomy looking at the rise in violent crime and homicide i think we may have ended the year at number 51 um, for 2019 very, very troubling. And you've indicated several times that for you, it is a very worrying situation. So as you look at what your strategy um, has been over the last year and looking forward, do you believe that all was done to, to create that sort of buffer between the perpetrators of crime and the law-abiding citizens of St. Ocean? So this unfortunately is a recurring theme. Um, in that I have to make reference to what we inherited. Um, so we inherited a situation in which um, radar system was not working, forensic lab was shut, there was no DPP, in fact the office itself had been depleted significantly, um, courthouses were shut, uh, no ammunition, uh, policemen's morale was very, very, very low, uh, lots of problems. So again, to say I'm going to push a button overnight and all of a sudden things are going to get resolved wasn't, wasn't going to happen. So when I first came in and I got my first briefing, I was just, I mean, speechless. I immediately moved security up very high. It was a high on the priority list, but I said we're, we're crisis point at this, at this point. And one of the critical things was we, a thousand case backlog in criminal cases. Uh, let's put that in perspective. That would take two judges almost three years and cost about $13.5 million to just deal with that backlog. And every year, we're adding more onto it because of the backlog. So it takes almost uh, somewhere between four and six years for a case to be able to be heard. Now, are you really going to have an effective justice system and, and a criminal uh, security system if in fact a person is arrested, is either put on remand and waits in jail for that period of time or is let out on bail um, until their case is being heard. Uh, so the, 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 the cry that crime doesn't pay was changed to crime does pay. And so there was no fear of being caught. Forensic lab in terms of getting the evidence wasn't there, all right? Courthouses, so when you did in fact want to get your, your case heard, uh, the, the courthouses were inadequate, um, were con constantly having to be closed because of problems, uh, massive, massive problems. So we've systematically looked to rebuild um, the police system from everywhere. So we've gotten now f three or four of the um, uh, uh, marine boats working. The radar system is working. The forensic lab is back up in operation and I'm very excited. Fingerprinting and DNA testing are now, uh, fingerprinting is already operational. By later um, uh, this year, the DNA testing will be in, huge. Um, we're, DPP's office has been replenished and is functioning. We're now working on the communication system. So for instance, policemen, didn't have any ways of communicating with each other other than using their own cell phones. So we now have a proper VHF system that's in place. That people can walk around with walkie-talkies. There's uh, access in your vehicles. Uh, training for policemen, adding new policemen. So we've added 40 new recruits um, into the police and we have now 42 uh, policemen uh, in the city that are, that are, that are helping. The city police the, department. The, the, the city police, right? added new vehicles, new um, motorbikes. So there's a lot of work that's taking place. And what I've said is one thing I know in life is that wherever there's effort, eventually there's going to be results. 
and speaking about all that, that works, we now want to share with our uh, viewers how all of that was able to unfold over the last year. And so we go to our special production there, looking back at some of the events in citizen safety for 2019. <music> On the agenda for government in 2019 was citizen safety with a focus on tackling the root causes of issues in that area. To ensure more boots on the ground, especially in identified crime hotspot areas, 18 new police officers were sworn into the Royal St. Lucia Police Force with an additional 42 to the city police unit. In addition to ensuring a larger police presence, Government also addressed the issue of failing equipment and transportation hindrances with the purchase of new vehicles, motorbikes and communication equipment. Operation of Coast Guard vessels and radar equipment were restored after an extended period of in-operation. Those interventions now ensure quicker response times and better communication between officers and units. Recognizing that accidents and crimes can happen without witnesses, government undertook the task of installing 180 CCTV cameras with over 525 to be installed at a cost of $5.8 million. To date, crimes have been solved and vehicular accident disputes resolved using this technology. After two years of the forensic lab being closed, government undertook much-needed refurbishment of the building at a cost of $700,000. The lab is now reopened and functional, with 13 staff members and the latest industry standard equipment necessary for solving crimes using DNA and other technology. The lab has given us solutions to at least two cases, one at Marisil with the elderly lady, and one from Jufort, a young lady called Zabi. Um, so we have the forensic on that, and it was found out that those individuals were the ones who committed the crime. And this is the way we have to go. Forensic evidence is going to be the way forward. Um, we, we can't rely on eyewitnesses or persons to come forward, because as a small society, we don't have the capacity for witness protection. We are just a small window of opportunity there. So we will have to rely, rely on the forensic. Intent on clearing out the backlog of cases and ensuring swifter justice, the government has fortified the office of the DPP by providing much needed resources. Additionally, the number of magistrates and judges have been increased to ensure criminal and civil matters are brought to a close as quickly as possible. Community after-school programs continued throughout 2019 in communities such as Marsha, Auger, Bellevue, Morshi, Babano, Jackmel, Soufre, and Foachou, to name a few. This program keeps young persons meaningfully engaged in sports, music, dance, and art. The program also entails mandatory life and social skills training, all helping to serve as a deterrent to the streets. Students are also served with meals during that time provided by the government. The community after-school program helps those young persons with self-development as well as building meaningful relationships and camaraderie. Programs such as this aim to tackle crime at the root. So as we saw there, we, we looked at in the video we saw that the courts, you know, the reopening of the Naira court, we spoke about the CCTV, which is massive investment uh, for the government. And um, most importantly, we saw the recruits, which we spoke about. So beefing up the, the police and wanting as well to, for more boots on the ground. Uh, for the government, as you begin to examine how it is that you could really um, tackle and because your aim is for a 45% reduction of serious crimes by the end of 2022. And so some people looking back at 2019 would believe that we're just not on target. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're disappointed in the numbers, but the fact is the effort is there. And we're starting to see 
um, people starting to believe in the system. So policemen had been given promises of new vehicles forever. Uh, policemen had been uh, given promises that we'd be fixing up their premises forever. Uh, policemen were still suffering from the impacts um, uh, situation uh, and the lack of proper training and the equipment to be able to do their job. So I think that everybody's starting to get the message that my government is committed and that when we make a promise to them that we're going to deliver on that promise. We now meet on a weekly basis. We've been doing that for mm, almost over a year. Every single Monday before cabinet, um, the uh, Minister of Security, the Attorney General, um, the delivery unit, and senior members of the police force, we meet and we go through the numbers. So we're measuring uh, 10 different serious levels of crime, robbery, burglaries, car theft, um, uh, homicides, a bunch of them that we look at and we're measuring them on a week by week basis trends as well as on a per annual basis and then compare to where we want the numbers to be able to get to. Uh, so people now are getting custom that they have to answer to these ideas. But as much as I'm putting those systems in, there are some other projects that we're working on where equally as important cause of the crime in the first place. So one, if you look at the number of homicides that happened late in the year, the vast majority of them were what? Brothers fighting with brothers, cousins fighting with cousins, friends fighting with each other, yeah? Uh, stabbing each other, shooting each other, simply because they couldn't control their tempers, all right? Big problem. Uh, police can't stop that. That's us as a society. And, and people recognizing that things are building up and try to separate people because once somebody's life is lost, they're lost. You can't bring them back. And so this is a societal problem that we have to be able to resolve. So then um, the thinking, the, how we think about crime, uh, when we look at personal responsibility, uh, where do, does each individual fit into the bigger picture of fighting crime? You're saying that we need to have a, a, a sort of shift in the mindset of how the nation views all of those factors. That's on homicide. So we see if you take gang of violence as well as and combine it now with um, uh, personal conflict, mm -hmm. that makes up the vast majority of the homicides we've had. The bigger one I'm concerned about really is robberies, burglaries, and car thefts. And I think that what happens, it affects a lot of people and it changes their mindset in terms of what the overall safety and the capacity of the police to actually carry out a proper investigation. So look, I'm not telling any tales behind school, but I think that most of us who've been in that, I have been robbed in the past, policemen came in. I've questioned how I see they're collecting the forensics, the fingerprinting and, and the DNA samples and how they inform me in terms of what they're doing. It's not really left me with a, a warm, fuzzy feeling that these crimes are going to be resolved. So by improving the forensic lab, now creating our own crime unit, a dedicated crime unit that are actually the ones collecting this evidence. Um, and the building of a database, because to be fair, if there isn't anything to match it up against, then we're really in the losing battle. Correct, and, and unfortunately, I'm the one who was involved in that discussion. Um, I remember when we opened the forensic lab the first time, uh, and I said, why, oh, you don't have any information in it. Why don't we use the fingerprints from the ID cards? Now, solutions have to, 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 to think about that and have a, a, a real discussion about that. I, for one, would like my fingerprint to be in it. Because if there's a crime, I want to know that I'm not the one who committed the crime. And if, in fact, it helps resolve crime and keeps me safer, that's a positive thing. But we have to weigh that up based on everybody's civil rights. And, and those, that's the discussion that will take place. But I genuinely believe that we should be able to have access to the fingerprinting off of ID cards. We're not doing it right now. But that's a discussion that needs to be able to take us here 100% correct. I think getting the DNA lab here. So for instance, a lot of people um, who are having sex with younger girls, um, we're now going to be able to provide the evidence as to whether they're doing that or not. Um, we've spoken to the policemen at traffic. Right? I, I think that solutions, when they start seeing that we're dealing with some of the smaller crimes on a more consistent basis, it builds confidence and starts changing people's overall attitude. You know, speeding, 
cars that, that aren't really uh, suitable to be on the road. Yeah? All these are very, very important things in terms of maintaining. Um, loitering, illegal activities, which we just let go. So who's making the decision? So what, somebody's acting as the judge every time to determine, well, this person can get away with it and this other person cannot. We have to be consistent in terms of how we're going to be enforcing. So there's an, a general attitudinal change that needs to take place. And I think that we're starting to get the buy-in now of the police force uh, to be able to do that. I mean, I'm, I'm committed to this police force. I absolutely feel for them in terms of what they've had to do. And I was just saying in a meeting today, uh, you go to a police station, um, the tiles are missing, the drain is clogged, there's no hot water, the toilet seat is missing, there's not proper towels, the washer and dryer are not working, the mattress hasn't been replaced in a long time, the kitchen is a mess, the furniture is falling apart. And they've not walked off the job. I, I'm gonna, I would rather talk about the good things that these guys have done than everybody wants to focus on all the negative things. And so my government has said, let me help. And that's where I'm really proud of the work that my wife is doing um, in terms of reinforcing in the policeman's mind that we want to celebrate them and that's why every year at the police ball we celebrate people who have retired and recognize the policemen, the police officers that um, are achieving great things. And, and to say to them, we do care, we do recognize what you're doing. To be able to get the insurance um, into them. We're looking at duty-free vehicles for policemen because if a policeman is going to be on duty, should he really have to be traveling in uniform on a public bus? Right, but again, these are things that um, have been outstanding for the longest amount of time, and we're now getting through all of them. So building the morale of the police force would result in better protection of the nation? It's one of the things. And that's why I'm saying to you, it's, there's not one thing by itself. It's a multitude of programs and efforts that are being made and initiatives in order to strengthen our police force. Border control. The computer terminals that you see at immigration, there's nothing in them. Nothing, nothing in, them. in them? No, for years. The company that provided the software went bankrupt, never been replaced. You know, a simple thing that when I went into the immigration office at the airport, and it was just piles of immigration cards, and you could smell the ink, and they had rats, and it was horrible. Even as prime minister, it took me six months to eventually get that to be moved. There's just uh, a malaise, generally speaking, um, and people are just become so despondent because the systems weren't working, and it, it was everywhere. Victoria Hospital, police stations, in your schools, on the roads, government buildings. So this attitudinal change that needed to take place, and that's why I'm saying this Christmas was the first time I've seen in a long time people's... Uh, confidence and hope was being restored and you could see people going out with smiles on their face. I went to Asu Square, um, I went around the island, I went into the shops and saw how packed it was and you can see that vibrancy that was starting to come back. And because I'm, you believe that they felt safe? Not just they felt safe, people were just feeling better about the direction this country was going in and it, you can see that they're becoming more comfortable with that and as more and more of the programs that we have been outlining, that we're outlining today are starting to manifest themselves. That will continue in my mind to contribute confidence. It's the same thing with the police. Some of them are going to run out of excuses. You have the communication systems. We have the ability to collect the intelligence. We knew who they were. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, we're getting advance notice. So in fact, if you're not doing your job, then there must be a different reason. And so the, holding them accountable would be far easier. That's what I'm hearing you saying. One of the other pillars, or would you call them 12 game changers uh, within the citizen safety in your budget address, you spoke very passionately about the rehabilitation and so that we can cut back on repeat offenders and so forth. Uh, how far a scope of a program are you expecting this to be? Is something confined solely to the bodily correction of facility or you expect it to be something broader across the spectrum for uh, law, uh, law enforcement? 
So we're, we're, we're examining a multitude of different options. So first of all, increasing the number of social workers. We have 12. We've added another three. We want to get to 30. Yeah? Um, and also to give them the resources. So that again, um, potential, uh, I don't want to call them criminals, okay? But potential. But at risk. Yes, at, at risk, risk individuals. Individuals. That we can address it early enough that they don't choose that path. First time youth offenders, even if it's a criminal case, why don't we use technology? They get convicted, they get on an ankle bracelet. Instead of me putting them in Bordelais, which I call LinkedIn, meaning that they're developing now a new Rolodex of, of contacts, they're getting a free education in crime, and they get a stigma associated to them, and that it makes it very difficult for them to choose any other career other than crime, um, that they're now reporting to a counselor, not even a parole officer, a counselor, who's now working with them to be able to get a proper job and they can start now going down a different road. The public is safe because they have um, this thing. A young person now is not condemned to a life of crime and they're given a new opportunity. And if they're in fact successful, what they get now is they come off of the ankle bracelet and they now have to just report like on a parole basis. Do we even know how much it costs to maintain um, a, a prisoner at Bordelais? So actually not having a Bordelais or a minimized Bordelais means with the same amount of money we might be able to implement a system like that. So creating kind of a halfway system where they're still having to give up some of their rights because they have an ankle bracelet on them, but at the same time they're being reintegrated and given a second chance in our society. And again, this is why I say as a small island, what may apply as a good program in bigger countries doesn't necessarily work here. So if I was in America and I got caught in Miami, I can go to Orlando, I can go to Jacksonville, I can go to Georgia, I can go to across the country, I can go to Chicago. Yes, I have a record, but people don't know me. Where are you going to go in Sub Lucia? Mm -hmm. Right? So we have to have a more compassionate country. Um, and address what the root cause of these problems are in the first place, you're never going to be able to eliminate it entirely. But malicious crimes and people who are deliberately threatening people's lives, stealing people's assets, we must do everything we can to rehabilitate. If we cannot, then that's where the traditional system will come in. But these are the kinds of discussions that we're having in terms of looking at a medium-term and a long-term solution to the problems we have. You know, it's funny because I once had a conversation with a career police officer and he asked me a question and said that in all of the years that we've had policing in St. Lucia, boots on the ground and all of those things, policemen come and go generation after generation. In the hotspots, we consider to be the crime hotspots, what has changed? And I had to pause and really think and he said, everything remains the same. It's just that you have a revolving door of police officers policing and, these hot spots. And the but people. the socioeconomic, and the people, but the socioeconomic status remains. And so I had to really give that some thought as you spoke about changing a mindset and the environment that, that came to mind that in those areas, that's the constant, the socioeconomic uh, status of these hotspot areas. The after-school program, that's another thing that uh, the government is passionate about, being able, again, to create that intervention to engage young people. Uh, are we broadening the scope, again, of this program? We are. It started off basically, um, and it really is at the school, at the schools itself, as the school facilities. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we learned a very, uh, you know, should have probably been more obvious. We had to include food, um, and and so providing a meal for the kids went a very long way in in, in encouraging participation in the program. But this um, club system that we're proposing and building the facilities to be able to do that, so. Uh, if you have a club, and the club can have drama, it can have sports in it. You have primary level and secondary level, and you have what we call senior leagues. Yeah? So a club can have a multitude of different programs, and it's in your community, right? And 
um, is by providing resources. So what we're saying is the money that currently goes into the lottery. So we're basically what we're doing is taking and dividing the lottery. Taking the regulatory part of what the lottery does, which is to provide the oversight of gaming, and putting that into the gaming authority, and now creating a new uh, youth and sports authority. And so that entity now will be putting together um, the uh, programs. So you can have different drama programs, different um, uh, uh, film programs, you can have dance programs all throughout the country after school. So I can come home after school into my community, I can go to dance class, I can then go to football class. Yeah? All in my same community. We know that when people participate in these kinds of activities, it helps them. So it teaches interaction, it teaches competition. To become successful, you must become disciplined. To create the, that desire to become successful is competition. So the more competition there is, and the higher the level of competition, the more discipline and the more work you have to be able to do. And you build self-esteem there. And, and you build self-esteem. Some will be concerned about the unattached youth. So I'm not at school, young, out of school, in the community. Does that also encapsulate these individuals? Yeah, so do we have a special program for that? So what happens is that we've talked about um, creating a, a, a social net, is how we describe it. So currently in the system, people for the most part, governments for the most part, have believed that you can help vulnerable people through taxation. I'm not going to put VAT on baby food or some of these products, as if somehow you're going to help a poor person. Or we're subsidizing the cost of rice, flour, and sugar. We're not only subsidizing it for the vulnerable person, but we're subsidizing it for everybody else. When we reduce the VAT on, on it, we're reducing um, uh, it for everybody. So we're saying, we don't think that that's the best way. So we're saying, let us use technology where everybody's going to become registered. They're going to have their insurance card. They're going to have their proper ID card. We're now going to keep track of who's working, who's not working, and what their status is. By decentralizing government into the local government between um, uh, elderly health care, mental wellness, and also sports, as well as our social programs um, to maintain who these people are. So your poverty list right now is not really a poverty list. Not everybody who deserves and, 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 and uh, deserves to be on the poverty list is. Poverty list is driven by what? How much money has been put into the budget? And so therefore, the people who are on are happy. People who are not on, they tell you, why is my government's not in government and this and that? And, and then the ministers get involved because they're clearly been getting pressured by their constituents. We said we have to create a system in which once you um, are deserving of it, that you get it. So some of these single mothers who don't have jobs, don't have the capacity to get jobs with multiple kids, right? We need to be able to provide free education, free bus transportation, free food, make sure the kids have more than one pair of shoes and also have their uniforms and have their school books or their e-book, make sure they're getting inoculated. All these things, the state must become the father. But the, equally, there are single fathers with multiple equally. children. Right. Correct. But, and once they are deserving, right, and that they don't have the capacity to do it for themselves, we have to be able to support that. Part of that is also providing them with the clothing and the ability to go to these sports programs. So this is why we're saying a minimum standard for everybody else. It is when kids are discriminated against, when all of a sudden there are kids who have and they have kids who have not, that these kids have to psychologically grow up not feeling the same. I, I spoke to um, some of the social workers. Some of these boys, nobody's ever hugged them. Nobody said, I love you. Who's going to their games with them? We need that. I can't imagine a day going by without me telling my son I love him. Can't imagine not hugging them. Yeah? And sometimes I, I see my son, oh, like he pretends like he doesn't want it. You know darn well that he does. And this is why I say that to all of us as St. Lucians, we see the problem every day in our neighborhoods. Let's go back to the days when we used to help each other out. Because you ignore that problem, that problem is going to come back 
and at some point it may confront you, right? We must have this love and this compassion for each other. We must learn to give. And there are some solutions who I just admire because they give above and beyond what they're supposed to. But not all of us do. And, uh, and we almost find a way to do that. So uh, the security problem is intertwined with a whole bunch of things. It's not going to get resolved with over, any one. No one with thing. Any one but thing. I want to make it very clear that we have not picked any one thing to solve the problem. Every aspect of it. We're injecting money, injecting resources, and continuing to monitor it. And that's why I say to you, I am confident, right? I can't tell you when, but I am confident that those efforts will pay off. People will see it. And the combination of everything that we're going to do is going to resolve this crime problem. And it's a good time for us to take a break. And when we come back, we'll be focusing on infrastructure. Lots of big, exciting prospects there for St. Lucia. And stay with us. See you on the other side of the break. I've been forced to do this by my trafficker. I was promised a better life, but got forced into domestic servitude. I can be any age. I can be any gender. Any ethnicity. I am. I am. I am a victim of trafficking in persons. Know the signs. See it. Report it. If you see me, please help me. Call the TIP hotline. Welcome back to our discussion with Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chastney, as we look back at the year 2019. Infrastructure, Prime Minister, and I see you already give that smile because, uh, again, referring to the Article 4 consultation for St. Lucia, I said that the projects that the government has in the pipelines, capital projects, certainly it would be a great jump start for uh, the economy. The expectation is that it is going to substantially boost growth between 2020 and 2022. So the focus for your government in the last um, financial year, the rehabilitation of the Millennium Highway and the West Coast Road, there's a reconstruction uh, or, or rehabilitation of secondary roads and uh, collector roads, feeder roads, and um, the redevelopment and expansion of the Hironora International Airport. We know that deserves a little special attention, so we're going to give it its due. But the rehabilitation for the Millennium Highway, uh, that is, I think a lot of people are in great anticipation because it's really, it really has become a great sort of connecting road uh, between um, Castries and the southern part of the island. Where are we at with that? Because some people want to be able to see that the tractors are going out and doing things you know, with immediacy. Is it happening? Yeah, um, so the, the monies or the funding for that project is coming from the DFID fund. So when um, David Cameron was prime minister, he committed something like 330 million pounds to CARICOM of which St. Lucia's portion was somewhere between 30 and 40 million pounds. Um, the former government had allocated that money towards the uh, um, North-South Highway. Uh, we just felt that that was not even going to be sufficient and the time um, to spend that money would not have been able to, we would not have been able to fulfill it. We felt that the Millennium Highway and we felt the West Coast Road in particular were in dire need of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we've allocated the money. So the project is managed by CDB. It has to go through, uh, first of all, a, a test, which it passed. 
um, to being qualified. Then it uh, had to get a, a, a bidding process to find a designer. So that was done last year. The designer came on board. The designer um, has completed the designs now um, of the project. We've gotten them to agree to break the project into three parts, the Millennium Highway and Ancillary being the first part. Uh, sorry, the Ancillary Bridge being the first part. Uh, and the uh, board of CDB is meeting or has met and hopefully approved um, the next phase, which would be now putting it out to bid. Uh, so once it goes out to bid, um, that takes about anywhere between two and three months, depending on how everything goes. Uh, so work should be commencing in March or April of this year on that project. The Millennium Highway, which I call the roller coaster, because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm surprised more people have not had accidents on that road. So we're very excited that that's going to take place. Uh, following on the heels of that was the uh, shock bridge, the, sorry, the cul-de-sac bridge, which is being done by JICA, the Japanese. Uh, sadly, you know, that was a project that was supposed to start much earlier. Um, when it was put out to bid, uh, the contractors did not come up with the prices that everybody had thought that they would have. And so it had to go back out to bid again, and this time reduce the, the project to just being the, um, the, the bridge itself. Uh, my understanding is that a Japanese company has been identified. They have visited here, and we're hoping to hear that, that the Japanese government has approved now for that project to be able to, to commence. So that project has been scaled down? The Ravin Poisson portion of it has been taken out, and we're looking for other resources to do that bridge, because that's such a critical bridge that we have to be able to do. Um, so I'm very excited about getting that road done. In, in addition to the Millennium Highway and the Ancillary Bridge, uh, will also be laybys. Uh, there's a huge component of, of strengthening of for, for resilience, so slope stabilization, safety in terms of barriers. Um, all along the high of the, the road going down to Sioux Frere. And, you know, that's obviously a very important road for us mm -hmm. um, from a tourism perspective and then also for the livelihood of the people who live in Ancillary and, and Canneries and also in Sioux Frere. All right, so the reconstruction for the secondary roads, the collector roads, uh, you, we now have what is deemed to be the largest ever in the history of St. Lucia for road rehabilitation and funded by the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, some $42 million, if, if memory serves me correct. Uh, portions of that program, I think, have sort of unfolded in the pockets, areas of communities. When can we expect to see a really large scale of the, the project unfolding? So it's already started. Um, Kasimba Road um, has been done. Um, the... Uh uh, Forest Air Road has been completed um, and some other roads in um, Babino have been done. Uh, we're Piat, um, Saltabus Road. Um, the Piat is hopefully going to start just now. Uh, there are a lot of roads, back roads in the Groselet and Castries North constituencies. Um, so there are roads all throughout St. Lucia, the length and breadth of St. Lucia. In my own constituency, the Blasha Road and the Spring Road, the Denry um, Town Roads, uh, there's roads in, in Miku North that are going to be done. So all throughout the length and breadth of this country, um, they're going to be started. So we have been, uh, had agreed with the Taiwanese to borrow approximately um, uh, 250 million U.S. dollars. 100, 100 million dollars went towards the, the airport. Uh, 8 million went, 4 million went to um, housing. 4 million U.S. went to the Ministry of Education and 40, 42 million is going into, into the road redevelopment. Uh, because of the loan and the structure of the loan, we have a five-year moratorium. So we actually will be doing an, an additional um, 10 or 12 million US dollars work of roads, primarily in the Groselet and also um, Castries area. Uh, so all those road works are starting right now. Uh, the designs have been completed, contract, I mean, uh, contract, subcontractors have been identified. My understanding is all they're doing is finalizing the negotiation between OECC and themselves um, to be able to proceed with, the, with that work program. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing the West Coast Road mm -hmm. as well as the uh, Millennium Highway. 
uh, the bridges that we're going to be doing, and then we're also doing feeder roads. So we have about 50 million EC dollars in helping uh, rebuild and, um, and re-strengthen and, and re redevelop feed roads. So uh, for my, our farmers, this is critical. And with the emphasis that we're doing on bananas, as well as in the uh, diversification programs, very, very, very important. And, and sadly, in all of these things, we're not getting to do everything that we need to do. So, you know, in terms of feeder roads, there should be about $80 million or more of work to be done. Uh, the roads that we're doing with the, uh, the Taiwanese only represents one third of the total roads in St. Lucia. Uh, so, but this is a beginning. Uh, it's going to be a significant impact on St. Lucia. And I have to say to everybody that this does not include any new roads. <laughs> this is just rehabilitating the existing what is roads. Already there. And that's why I'm saying is that the deterioration of the infrastructure of this country was just going unabated. Not enough money was being spent over the years on maintaining the existing roads. And even after a period of time, even if you're maintaining a road, you're going to have to rehabilitate it. Um, the other big project I'm sure you're going to bring up is uh, the North South Highway. Yes. Critical, critical road. Um, so there was a feasibility that was done by CDB. We are in discussions with the Americans, the Canadians, and with the Taiwanese um, to look at the final, putting in a final design for, those, for that road and coming up with a final costing. But preliminary costs are around 300 million US dollars to be able to develop that road. Uh, we have set aside $28 off of the airport tax um, in order to be able to fund that road. So as soon as we have been able to finalize everything, we will assign $28 to be able to do that. Once we've completed the airport, and we think that if we see an increase in arrivals in excess of 500,000, that we can actually pay off the loan uh, for the airport quicker, and then now assign that money to be able to help us to complete that highway. But I, I wanna say that, that probably it is one of the most significant infrastructure projects that we would have to take. This is the one project that really takes St. Lucia to the next level. So when you go to Barbados as an example, think of Barbados without the ABC Highway. And that's exactly where we are. And those people who are traveling between Castries and Groselet know exactly what I'm talking about. How much of the traffic that wants to go up north doesn't need to come through Castries? How much of the land on the east coast that we can't access because there's not a proper road there? Uh, so if, in fact, now you have the container port in cul-de-sac, you now have a proper Millennium Highway that's going to continue to Denry with a tunnel through to Bartlehill, and then you have two industrial highways that are going north and south at that point, that even the distribution of cargo and uh, in, uh, commercial traffic now can go on that major highway, and I think it's going to make a significant difference um, in the growth potential of solution. All right. You're giving yourself a timeline and within which this should be completed? We would like, we would like um, uh, before our term completed this time, to have secured the financing and finalized the designing. If, in fact, we could start, that would be a bonus. Um, but right now, uh, given um, the constraints we have, because we don't have an, a limitless supply of monies, right. we were able to create some space for ourselves by introducing the airport tax and by putting in the gas tax. Um, so that therefore these claims and allegations that the country is um, rudderless and that we have problems financially is not true. We are seeing an improvement in tax collections, which are continuing to pay to recurrent, and, uh, recurrent expenditure. Mm -hmm. But these new projects that we're bringing in have their own dedicated revenue streams. And certainly every major project that we're bringing in we're trying to have some form of dedicated revenue stream. And so the goal is not to burden the taxpayer nor increase the national well, the debt tax, burden. The taxpayer is paying, right? Because whether it's through a gas tax, um, whether it's through an airport tax, I mean, the, the majority of the airport tax is being paid for by, by the tourists, and all these things help now improve our overall our, our, our tourism product. But there are people who but try... But not to burden them by having to take loans. Correct. So the government having to well, take it's loans not, it's, and it's not to burden It's not to burden the state um, in the sense that we are running deficits. So uh, the, 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 the most worrisome number that St. Lucians should have been aware of 
under the previous government regime was the fact that we were spending 170 million EC dollars a year on interest. In 2003, that number was 33 million, right? That's a lot of money to be paying in interest. And so we need to be mindful of that. And what we've been able to do is not allow that number to grow. We've been able to do that by uh, reducing the amount of short-term uh, treasury bills we have, by not borrowing as much money as we had before um, that's going to have to come out of the recurrent expenditure. So all that $170 million is coming out of recurrent expenditure. So the interest and the principal on these new loans are being paid for by these dedicated taxes. The redevelopment of the Hironor International Airport, we did have an announcement on uh, the midway through 2019 that the you know, sort of first phase was beginning uh, with that project. Some people would believe that false start. Um, not really. I mean, you and I had this discussion um, a while back. When a project begins is not when you see the ground breaking uh, taking place. There are so many things that have to go on behind the scenes. So this is a very big project. Um, a tremendous amount of soil testing, uh, EIAs, uh, designs, all had to be done. And in the midst of it, we've been negotiating with the United States government to be able to have what we call a pre-clearance facility. So it means that U.S. passengers um, leaving St. Lucia would actually clear U.S. customs and immigration here. And so there had to be adjustments in the design that we were going to be able to make. Uh, we have been in negotiations with the Taiwanese, the OECC, um, in terms of finalizing the, the loan. We had to organize the other forms of the loan. So the $100 million from the Taiwanese was not going to complete the project. But the loan that we got from the Taiwanese with the five-year moratorium gives us the ability to borrow additional money, which we did. So we borrowed $75 million from a consortium of banks. We've been to Parliament twice with that particular bill, and we're now just finalizing that term agreement. So we can't start the heavy work until all of the loan agreements have been passed. My understanding is, is the final approvals are going to the uh, uh, SLASPA board on Friday. But meanwhile, all the plans have been completed. The preliminary uh, master plan has been approved by planning. The infrastructure for the, uh, the foundation, which is going to require almost 2,000 piles because the, the soil is very soft there, all that has been completed. And my, my understanding is that they're very far advanced with their um, negotiations with the subcontractors in terms of allowing that project to proceed. So we're expecting very shortly what people are expecting to see, which is the physical part of it, would have happened. But we've been collecting the money. Um, a lot of laws have had to be changed. A lot of things had to be done in order to be able to accommodate this project. But I'm very excited as to the progress we've made. It's a very difficult project. And I really want to commend SLASPA. And I want to again thank the government of Taiwan um, for uh, extending their hand and providing us with this concessional loan. Wonderful. Now, as we are beginning to wrap up our discussion, Prime Minister, the unemployment rate, and of course that will fall in line with all of those pending projects that we have because people have anticipation of, of jobs. We're now seeing that there's a fall from 25% to 17%. Uh, the youth unemployment is also down 10%. Uh, so we are from the 44%, we're now at 34%. And I do hear you say, not necessarily comforting. Yeah, I, again, these are all things that tell us that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, when you have even 17% of your population unemployed, that's distressing, you know, but relative to where we came from, it's, it's, an, it's a substantial improvement. And those numbers were numbers that we got in September. So I have to imagine that we should be getting the next quarter numbers. I, I genuinely believe that those numbers are going to come down. And certainly with um, the major projects starting, I think that our promise of getting to 15% in our first term, that we're actually going to beat that, that number um, and beat it quite significantly. Uh, so unemployment is an, is an important measure. Uh, and as we see more people becoming employed, and more people have money in their pockets, and people start spending that money like we saw over the Christmas period, 
then it becomes uh, uh, effective, meaning that more and more people now will start being employed and uh, businesses hopefully continue to be confident uh, moving forward. Before we get to your expectations for 2020, I want to give you some time to talk about your tenure as the chairman of the Caribbean Community CARICOM, which has come to an end because we now have Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, who has now assumed the chairmanship. Your uh, experience, detail that for us if you can, or encapsulate for us what that experience was like at a critical time because we did have uh, the heads of government conference here. Um, lots of issues were on the table, very pressing issues, climate change being one of the, the primary things, as well as getting the CARICOM as an organization to function in such a way uh, that it is more meaningful and delivers more meaningfully to CARICOM nationals. Um, so, look, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity of being chairman. Uh, as I said to you, uh, the chairmanship really means that you're the, watch, the night watchman. Um, because there's not really a lot that you're going to be able to accomplish in six months. So it's whatever the critical issues that, that come up, it's your turn to be on night watchman. So you're the first uh, line of response to any of these issues. So the situation in Haiti, we had a very um, tense situation in Guyana um, that we were working through. Uh, we had uh, elections in Dominica, um, which required the um, RSS forces to be able to go in and be able to help. Uh, and then the continued work program that we have, the blacklisting with, the, um, with uh, some of the countries, uh, the climate change, as you indicated, was a real, a real topic. Um, CSME, because that was a hot topic of discussion um, when, when we were here, uh, the improvements of a regional security system. Mm -hmm. So uh, lots of things to be able to keep your, your, your pulse on. And correspondent banking. Correspondent, Critical. yeah, we yeah. had a we had a very important meeting in in uh, Washington D.C. I want to thank Prime Minister Gaston Brown, um, who leads that that segment. Uh, we I had also the opportunity of meeting with um, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, uh, late in the year. I also had the opportunity of meeting Prime Minister Boris Johnson very late in the year, and on both cases, using the opportunity to push forward um, the CARICOM initiative. I know that we've been trying for some time to be able to get Prime Minister Trudeau to come to a CARICOM heads of government meeting. I'm really hopeful that he will come to the meeting in Barbados um, in, in, in February. So I just want to say that, you know, with CARICOM, it, it doesn't stop. There's a continual agenda that we have to be able to follow. My government's position on regional organizations is they must achieve at least uh, one of two things, if not both. One is to improve the quality of governance in our country. So it means that the quality of my health care, the quality of my education system, the quality of my security system ought to be enhanced by regional participation. Um, secondly, that the cost of governance should come down. So by sharing some of these things, that the cost for me should come down. But ideally what you want is both. You want to see mm -hmm. a, a reduction in costs and an improvement in the overall quality. And I'm not so sure we're always getting that. And I think that, uh, honestly, that uh, and a lot of people have said this. I'm not the first. That, that, that CARICOM is in, in need of some structural reform itself. Uh, sadly, um, I was not able to make it to Guyana to meet with the staff and to be able to interact with them. Um, I was not able to spend any time looking at those structures uh, because we were overwhelmed with both situations in St. Lucia and also other issues within CARICOM, Haiti being a very big one. Again, you know, very early we were supposed to have a trip to, to Haiti. Unfortunately, things got much worse. Um, they've seemed to have settled down a little bit, but that continues to remain um, a hot topic for, for, for us to be able to discuss. Although it's far from the public mind. But as we say hello to 2020, Mr. Prime Minister, in our remaining moments, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your own expectations for yourself, you, the government, and where you see St. Lucia going within this uh, new year. Well, we have 18 months left um, uh, uh, before elections. Um, I'm excited um, at the prospects because we've put a lot of hard work in. I'm expecting that uh, a lot of the, 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 the results of that hard work will become visible this year. 
both from an infrastructural perspective, because people actually physically see work taking place, um, from a policy perspective, our Headquarters Act, um, the work that we're doing with the Europeans in terms of uh, making our financial sector secure, uh, that ought to be coming into fruition. I, th I think that we're going to continue to see our tourism grow. I'm very excited about uh, the prospects of, of coming with a major project with the cruise industry, particularly for Castries redevelopment, as well as putting a port in view for it. I think a, a, a cruise ship port in view for it and a home port in particular are gonna, is going to transform the south, not just view for it, but all the way to Sioux Fair and up to Denry. Uh, I'm excited about the work that's taking place in agriculture. Uh, I'm very excited about the work that's taking place in education. Uh, I'm, I'm very pumped about the new um, recording studio and uh, broadcasting unit that's going to be put at the old um, St. Lucia radio, radio station Lucia and to be integrated into Sir Arthur Lewis. We've put a lot of work into thinking what we're going to do at Sir Arthur Lewis. Um, so the new uh, principal uh, and where he comes from and what he's doing is exciting. Uh, so there's a lot I'm looking forward to, uh, but it means that we just need to remain extremely focused. Very easy for people, because it's 18 months, to start thinking about elections. So my attitude is, is that we're keeping our foot on the accelerator uh, very hard this year. And really, I'd like to get to a point where m maybe we can get into fixed dates for elections. Um, as well as um, spending less on elections. I mean, I see some countries, our neighbor in the North America, seems to be in perpetual election mode and the amount of money that they spend. Whereas when I, was, I saw the Canadian elections, you wouldn't even know it, it came and went. Um, uh, I think England also has a very good system in terms of restriction, how much advertising and everything else that can be done, and a lot more controls. So I think it's important that um, people exercise their democratic rights. But I think as a small country, the amount of time that is attributed to it, we have to be very, we have to be very cautious. Uh, I have ignored um, my party um, politically in many ways. Um, you know, when I was in opposition, it afforded me the opportunity to spend substantially more time in my constituency branches and dealing with the party. And, and you know, you have a chairman of a party and you have a political leader of a party, and it really is to continue to allow that to be nurtured. So I think that now that we've been able to accomplish what we have from a government, and it really required my full-time attention, uh, my family um, and my political party, both I believe have suffered from the amount of time that I've had to focus um, on turning this thing around with, 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 with uh, the country. I'm not so sure I could ever describe to people um, what we were confronted and how difficult it has been to achieve what we had to achieve. Uh, the meetings with the World Bank and the IMF to build up their level of confidence, to be able to attract investors. I mean, this year, huge task ahead. We have $700 million of bonds that come due that we have to roll over. And so it's about keeping the confidence of those people, letting them understand and hopefully appreciate that we're on the right track. So again, in the sake of politics sometimes, when we are prepared to demean the brand in the name of St. Lucia, in the name of politics, we sometimes forget how much damage that we're doing. But unfortunately, that's not just unique to St. Lucia. That's unique everywhere. And so as a government, we have to continuously put ourselves in a position to be able to overcome that and let people know that there are uh, things that are taking place that are very positive, um, that we are a country that follows the rule of law, and that we believe that the strategy we have is a very effective one. So, that's why when you hear about the reduction in unemployment, what's happening to the debt to GDP, um, what's happening with some of the, uh, the other projects, these are important milestones in terms of continuing to build and keep people's confidence. But I don't want solutions ever to believe for one minute that we as a government believe that that's what the final uh, road is going to be. Not until all solutions, and I do mean all solutions, um, are taken care of in this country and are living what we consider to be a decent, a decent living, um, will we ever stop? And it may not happen and be completed by the time my term of office completes, but I'm hoping that like many of the other leaders before me, particularly Sir John, um, that I would have made a, contri a significant contribution towards uh, achieving that. And solutions will be well on their way to living their best life ever.
Thank you so much, Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chastney. We know it has been a very busy time for you, for taking the, the time of the schedule to be able to sit with us and give us a, a further insight into what it is the government of St. Lucia has been doing in the last year. But that brings us to the end of our special production, the year in review for 2019. I've been your host, Mr. Joseph. See you next time.